Amen. And please turn with me in God's Word now to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 and 3, which is on page 2 in your Bibles. Page 2 and 3. We'll be meditating actually on some verses earlier in chapter 1 and 2, but I'm just going to read from Genesis 2, verse 25, uh, down to the end of chapter 3. So let's give attention now to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired Word. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say... You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust." And to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his, for his wife the garments, garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And thus far God's holy word may bless our hearts uh, this afternoon. I also invite you to grab a copy of your uh, Three Forms of Unity from... You can find in the Forms and Prayers book, Belgian Confession, Article 14, on page 166. It's page 166 in the Forms and Prayers book. And we come in our series now to Article 14, the creation and fall of man. So let's listen now as we hear what we believe and confess based on God's Word. We believe that God created man from the dust of the earth and made and formed him in his image and likeness, good, just, and holy, able by his own will to conform in all things to the will of God. But when he was in honor, he did not understand it and did not recognize his excellence. 
but he has subjected himself willingly to sin and consequently to death and the curse, lending his ear to the word of the devil. For he transgressed the commandment of life which he had received. And by his sin, he separated himself from God, who was his true life, having corrupted his entire nature. So he made himself guilty and subject to physical and spiritual death, having become wicked, perverse, and corrupt in all his ways. He lost all his excellent gifts, which he had received from God, and he retained none of them except for small traces, which are enough to make him inexcusable. Moreover, all the light in us is turned to darkness, as the Scripture teaches us, the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness did not receive it. Here John calls men darkness. Therefore we reject everything taught to the contrary concerning man's free will, since man is nothing but the slave of sin, and cannot do a thing unless it is given him from heaven. For who can boast of being able to do anything good by himself, since Christ says, no one can come to me unless my Father who sent me draws him. Who can glory in his own will when he understands that the mind of the flesh is enmity against God? Who can speak of his own knowledge in view of the fact that the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God? In short, who can produce a single thought since he knows that we are not able to think a thing about ourselves by ourselves? but that our ability is from God. And therefore, what the Apostle says ought rightly to stand fixed and firm. God works within us both to will and to do according to His good pleasure. For there is no understanding nor will conforming to God's understanding and will apart from Christ's work. As He teaches us when He says, without Me, you can do nothing. Well, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, at this point in our confession of faith, uh, we transition from considering the doctrine of God uh, to the doctrine of man. Uh, having just recently set forth the doctrines of creation and providence in Articles 12 and 13, our confession now turns to the creation and fall of Adam in Article 14 before describing the consequences of Adam's fall upon all of us in Article 15, which deals with original sin. And the creation and fall of Adam sets the tone for all the material discussed in Articles 16 through 26 of our confession, which collectively deal with the various aspects of our redemption from sin and which play out against the backdrop of Adam's fall. We cannot fully understand and... Uh, appreciate the greatness of God's grace in saving us from the guilt and power of sin unless we are clear about the consequences of Adam's rebellion against God. We cannot fully appreciate how amazing God's grace is in our salvation unless we first understand Adam and his rebellion against God and our relationship to Adam. And so the next two articles of our confession are dark. But just as stars shine brightest when the night is darkest, so too the more we see the darkness of our sin and corruption, the brighter our Savior shines for us in our redemption. And so it's important that we consider these things. And this afternoon we'll see here uh, man's original creation, and then secondly, man's tragic fall and corruption, and then third, man's total inability to save himself. So first, we see man's original creation. It's always important that we start with man's original creation when we talk about him and, and when we talk about sin. Did God originally create man sinful? No. We see in the Bible that Man was originally created good and in the image of God. In Genesis 1, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And it, then it goes on at the end and it says, And God saw everything that He made, and behold, it was very good. There was no taint of sin. There was no taint of wickedness. It was very good. Now what does it mean to bear the image of God? Man not only bears the image of God, but man is the image of God. Wow. <laughs> If you were falling asleep, you're awake now. That could come in handy. Um, <laughs> so what does it mean, though, to bear the image of God? Well, it means that we have uh, God-given gifts or capacities and God-given tasks that no other creature has. As image bearers of God, we are rational, spiritual, moral, and relational creatures in a way that animals are not. We are distinct from animals. We are above the animals. All the animals, if you go back to Genesis 1, it says we're, they were created each according to its kind. It says over and over again this refrain, each according to its kind, each according to its kind. But then when you come to man, you can see that he is the pinnacle of creation in a number of ways. One, there's just way more verses devoted to him and it says, let us, it doesn't say each according to its kind, it says let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Uh, and so man, as the image of God, has a special dignity and worth that is above the animals. And as we perform the various tasks that God has called us to through the gifts He's given us, we reflect His glory. But what are those gifts and tasks that God has given us? Well, they can be summed up in, in three offices, if you will. This may sound familiar. Prophet, priest, and king. We're familiar with those offices as they are the offices of Christ. As our mediator, He is our prophet, priest, and king. Well, Adam was the first prophet, priest, and king in the garden. He was a king. Adam was created to be God's vice regent on earth his royal representative. And he was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and to subdue it and to exercise dominion over it. That's just one of many verses in these opening chapters that reflect his royal dignity, his kingship. He was to exercise dominion over the creation. As we sang in Psalm 8, all, everything's been placed beneath man. So he was God's king on earth. And just as God formed and filled the earth in the days of creation and ruled over it, Adam was to fill the earth with the image of God and rule over it under God and reflect the glory of God. And so he was a king in the garden, given the gifts and capacities to fulfill that duty as king on earth. But he was also created as a priest. Uh, the Garden of Eden was a prototypical temple. Now, there's a big word. What is a prototypical? What does that mean? Well, it means den denoting the first original or typical form of something. Think of prototype. Maybe that's a little more familiar. Prototype. It was a prototype of the future temple. Well, how do we see that? How do we know that? Well, if you were to compare the Garden of Eden and everything in these opening chapters to uh, tabernacle and temple imagery throughout the Bible, you'll see all kinds of connections. Like the temple, which had its entrance facing east, the Garden of Eden had an eastern entrance. We see that in Genesis 3 when Adam is expelled from the garden, God places a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden to guard the entrance and way back to the Tree of Life. Furthermore, the Garden of Eden had rivers we read about in Genesis 2. And that's like the river in Ezekiel's end time temple that flows forth from the throne of God in the temple. Uh, the Garden of Eden was on a mountain. And you're thinking, well, I don't remember reading about a mountain in Genesis 2. 
Well, it's implied in the fact that the rivers flowed out of Eden. You know, that thing we call gravity. <laughs> Downhill. Uh, it's also mentioned in Ezekiel 28 as well, which references the Garden of Eden and how Adam was on the mountain of God. Uh, the Garden of Eden had trees and flowers, and that's probably no surprise to you, right? But that's something that was carved into the temple. Trees and flowers, palm trees. And it had precious stones and metals. The Garden of Eden, when you read in Genesis 2, has precious stones and metals. Another feature that was in the temple. And when God expelled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, He placed what to guard the entrance of the Garden of Eden? Children, maybe you remember What did he place to guard the entrance back into the Garden of Eden? He placed a cherubim angel with a flaming sword to guard every way back into the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Well, what's embroidered on the curtain of the temple? Cherubim are embroidered on the curtain of the temple to guard the Holy of Holies. There's temple imagery all over the place in Genesis 2 and 3. It was a garden temple, a prototypical temple. And Adam was God's priest. Uh, The very duties that God gave Adam in the garden were priestly duties that we read about in Genesis 2.15. In the ESV, it says he was to work and keep the garden, which kind of just makes it sound like he was a gardener, right? Just work and keep the garden. Well, in the Hebrew, it more literally says to uh, keep and guard the garden. And those two Hebrew words, when you look throughout the Old Testament, are almost always used of the duties of priests in the temple. They are to keep and guard the sanctity of the temple and let no unclean thing enter the temple. And so, Adam was a priest. And when he was expelled from the temple because he was unclean because of his sin, he's expelled and he still has this duty to keep things but no longer to guard. Now that's given to the cherubim who takes the priestly duty of guarding the sanctity of the temple because Adam can no longer do that. He's unclean himself. And so Adam was a priest and he was to expand the garden temple of Eden to the ends of the earth by subduing the rest of creation and exercising dominion over it, he was to spread God's image by being fruitful and multiplying, and he was to spread the temple of God until the whole earth was God's temple filled with the image of God, reflecting His glory. And Adam was a prophet, as we said, in that he was to proclaim the word of the Lord to his wife and children and all of his posterity. What was the content of his sermons? Well, it was pretty simple. He was to tell them the positive commands he had been given so that the task could be carried out. And he was to proclaim God's prohibition of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so he was the first prophet, priest, and king. This is what it meant to bear the image of God in the various God-given tasks that Adam received. And of course, he was not alone in this we see that He was given a helper in the woman who bore the image of God as well with man. It says in Genesis 1, 27, so God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. So you see, we all bear the image of God as individuals, male and female. But we are meant to better reflect God's glory by bearing that image communally. Just as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are in loving relationship with each other, so too are we to reflect the glory of our trying God by being in loving relationships with each other and working together to reflect His glory. Right? We need one another. Man needs woman. Woman needs man. We need one another to better reflect the glory of God. And originally, man had the God-given gifts to do exactly what God had called him to do. He had the gifts and capacities to obey God perfectly and reflect His glory 
in these tasks. Our catechism puts it this way, that God created man good and in His own image, that is in true righteousness and holiness, so that he might truly know God, his Creator, love Him with all his heart, and live with God in eternal happiness for His praise and glory. Isn't that amazing to think about? That Adam had the ability to love God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. He had no taint of sin. He was, he was righteous and holy and he knew his God and, and he was able to obey God's law perfectly. That can't be said about us. But he was originally created with the ability to obey God's law perfectly. Or as our confession puts it, Belgian Confession, Article 14, God created man from the dust of the earth and made and formed him in his image and likeness, good, righteous, and holy able by his own will to conform in all things to the will of God. And Adam was in a, a covenant relationship with God in the garden that can be described as a covenant of works. Uh, when our confession refers to the commandment of life, it's referring to this covenant that God made with Adam as the representative of the human race. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 7, describes the covenant of works like this. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. So he was given these commands to keep and guard the garden, to be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth, exercise, subdue it and exercise dominion over it, and don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Adam wouldn't have just worked and worked and worked and, and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. No, he would have eventually received the reward of consummate eternal life. This reward was held out to him that's pictured in the tree of life and in the eternal Sabbath rest of God on the seventh day day of creation, which is an eternal day. That was held out to him. The very thing that Christ, our second Adam, has won for us, the new heavens and new earth, an age of consummation where we'll no longer be subject to the possibility of a second fall, be confirmed forever in a state of righteousness, never again to sin. That's what Adam was working towards. And had he obeyed, he would have ushered in the consummation and brought him and his wife and children and all his posterity into that age. But he failed, as we know. He failed. He sinned and rebelled. But it's important that we first understand that he ha this, is the, this is the state in which he was cre originally created. Good, righteous, holy, able, to fulfill God's law and obey it perfectly. He was a prophet, priest, and king. And yet he willingly forfeited these things. And that brings us to our second point, man's tragic fall and corruption. We go on to confess in our confession, but when he was in honor, he did not understand it and did not recognize his excellence, but he subjected himself willingly to sin and consequently to death and the curse, lending his ear to the word of the devil. For he transgressed the commandment of life which he had received, and by his sin he separated himself from God, who was his true life, having corrupted his entire nature. So he made himself guilty and subject to physical and spiritual death. And so we see here that Adam of his own free will sinned against God. He embraced the lie of the devil when the devil said, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat, in your, eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He embraced that lie. And like Eve, he saw the fruit was pleasant to the eye and he took it and ate it in rebellion against his Creator. As R.C. Sproul put it, he committed cosmic treason. And the consequences of his sin were immediate and tragic, both for himself and for all of us, since he was our federal head. He was not a private person. He was a public person. He represented the entire human race. 
And because of our relationship to Him, it's as if when He sinned, we sinned personally as well. As the Puritans used to put it, in Adam's fall, sinned we all. His guilt is credited to our account from the moment we're conceived in the womb. It's imputed to us immediately, as we'll see uh, next week when we consider original sin. And not only do we receive the guilt of Adam's sin, we also are conceived and born in sin. And our whole nature is corrupt from the time we're in the womb. And from this corrupt nature springs forth all of our actual sins. So you see, this is why the world is the way that it is. Namely, a place where evil and suffering abounds. This is yet another point which divides Christianity from all other religions. Every sickness we have ever suffered, every funeral we have ever attended, every war which has ever been fought, every act of cruelty and theft, every lie and word of slander has its origins in Adam's act of rebellion in Eden. Remember that God said of Eden that it was very good. There was no defect in His good creation. Sin and death were not a part of His original creation. There would have been no you know, alerts on your phone like you got today about some bad people running around in Saskatchewan, stabbing people. Rather, they, all these things sin and death and suffering, they stem from the sin of Adam when he rebelled and sought to be alone to himself and transgress God's law. And his transgression invoked God's curse upon all of creation. It brought sin and death into this world so that we all are born spiritually dead and we all will one day die physically and ultimately suffer God's eternal wrath, eternal death, unless we're born again and trust in Christ. There's just no way of escaping the consequences of Adam's sin. The only thing we can hope for is to be redeemed from sin and death through the work of our second Adam, Jesus Christ. But before we consider the work of Christ, let's consider third, man's total inability to save himself. When Adam fell, uh, humanity retained certain aspects of the image of God. We know this from passages like Genesis 9 and James 3, In Genesis 9, after the fall, God says to Noah, after he's exited the ark, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. So this is a post-fall statement. So we see here that there's still some kind of remnants of the image of God in man that serve as the basis for why you shouldn't murder. And James 3, verse 9 says, With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So again, there's a post-fall statement. The basis for why we should not curse our neighbor is because they're created in the likeness of God, James says. So you see, we still bear certain aspects of the image of God after the fall. We're still rational and moral creatures. Outside of Christ, we're still under the covenant of works. Even though Adam fell, God hasn't revoked His law, which is His perfect standard of righteousness and a reflection of His character. We're still called to bear His image. We're to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and exercise dominion over it. But the sad truth is that we have all lost the capability of fulfilling the covenant of works and ushering the consummation of God's kingdom. We can't bring about the consummation of the kingdom because the creation is under a curse, and we are sinful by nature. No longer is our nature good and capable in all things to will agreeably to the will of God. We can't do that anymore. Rather, our nature is corrupted by sin, and we are now prone to hate God and our neighbor. And so there's nothing left in man that can save himself. As our confession puts it, having become wicked, perverse, and corrupt in all his ways, he lost all his excellent gifts which he had received from God 
And he retained none of them except for small traces which are enough to make him inexcusable. Moreover, all the light in us is turned to darkness as the Scripture teaches us. The light shone in the darkness and the darkness did not receive it. Here John calls men darkness. We're radically corrupt. We're radically corrupt. And we need to stress that. That we're radically corrupt by nature now and completely unable to save ourselves. And this isn't just an opinion of you know, us Reformed people, Calvinists. No, this is the clear teaching of God's Word. And I want it to be absolutely clear to you all that this is the Word of God. So listen to this just sampling of what the Bible says about our nature after the fall. Psalm 51 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 130 says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Proverbs 20 says, Who can say I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. Ecclesiastes 7 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Isaiah 53 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 64 says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Here's one for our contemporary culture that says, you know, follow your heart. Just follow your heart. Well, Jeremiah 17 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The Bible says don't follow your heart. Follow God's Word. Jeremiah 13 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Mark 7, Jesus says, For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, Envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. And they defile a person. It reminds me of an illustration of this principle that I once saw from uh, Paul David Tripp where he takes a bottle of water and he shakes it. And then he asks, why did water come out of that bottle? And people want to say, well, because you shook it. And he says, well, let me say that again, but emphasize something else. Why did water come out of that bottle? And the answer is because there's water in the bottle in the first place. Why does pride and sinful anger and adultery and all the other sins come out of us? Because they come from within. We have a sin nature within. We cannot say, well, it's all these outside things that have made me do it. No, it came ultimately from within. John 3 says, and this is the judgment, the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. John 8 says, uh, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. That's the condition of everyone outside of Christ. They're a slave to sin. Romans 3 says, all both Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Romans 8 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Outside of Christ, in the flesh, your sin nature, you cannot please God. 1 Corinthians 2, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Finally, Ephesians 2 says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like 
the rest of mankind. And so you see, we, man is not basically good. Outside of Christ, after the fall, we are radically corrupt. All of us, we're all incapable of saving ourselves. Nor will anyone ever come to Christ unless the Holy Spirit first regenerates that person's heart. Otherwise, they just have a dead heart, spiritually dead, stony heart, hard heart. And so our salvation, you see, is entirely from beginning to end based on God's sovereign, gracious initiative, which began in eternity past in the Father's unconditional election of some to salvation and was accomplished in Christ's definite atonement on the cross and is applied to us when the Holy Spirit effectually opens our heart to believe in Christ. Otherwise, we're doomed. None of us would have ever done anything to choose God first and do anything to come to Christ of our own accord. Jesus said over and over again in John 6, this is the work of God that you believe in Him who, whom He has sent. All that the Father gives me, that's election, will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And then He says later, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. He goes on again. He says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Nobody will ever come to Christ unless the Holy Spirit opens that person's heart. But we have confidence that the gospel changes hearts, that the Holy Spirit uses that to open the hearts of God's elect people. And so we proclaim the gospel to everyone indiscriminately and trust that the Spirit will open the hearts of God's elect people. But you see, your salvation has nothing to do with anything you did. It's all because of God's unconditional election, the work of the second Adam in his life and death and resurrection, and the Spirit's sovereign work of regeneration. In other words, God didn't look down the corridors of time, like some people say, and see, okay, well, I'm going to choose whoever chose me first. All He would see is dead people. Spiritually dead people. And so He first chose them. And so we owe Him all the glory. We owe Him all the glory in our salvation and must be thankful and humble for that. But He sent His only Son into this world who perfectly bore the image of God in our place being obedient to his father's commands even to the point of death on a cross and because he fulfilled the covenant of works where Adam failed you and I are no longer in a covenant of works who trust in Christ we are now in a covenant of grace you are no longer under law but under grace that's what Paul means you're no longer under law as a covenant of works do this and live. Or don't do it and you're cursed. You're no longer under the, a law, the law as a covenant works, but you're under a covenant of grace now with Christ as your mediator. Your salvation is all a grace and received by faith alone. And if you have faith in Christ, you're no longer an Adam. He no longer represents you. You're in Christ as your, who's your second Adam. And He won for you and me the consummation of the kingdom. He entered into it that eternal Sabbath rest that was originally held out to Adam in the garden. And he will, he, we're united with Him in that. And He'll bring us all with Him to that eternal rest in new heavens and new earth. So He succeeded where Adam failed. He, doesn't just, he didn't just win for us you know, just the forgiveness of sin so that we're like back in a relationship with God like Adam was, a covenant of works, now trying to earn it again. No, He, he actually wipes the slate clean for us so that we're forgiven and we're justified. We're declared righteous as if we lived His life and obeyed perfectly. We're declared righteous. And because of that, we are given the reward, the eternal life. Well, so we see here man's original creation 
the fall and corruption of man and man's total inability. But how then should we, how then should these things affect the way we live? I just want to conclude with three applications. First, with regard to man's original creation, we see that man was created through a direct act of God to bear the divine image. And so he has a God-given dignity that we should all respect in every single human being. Man is not an animal, nor has he evolved from animals. He is the image of God, a dignity that no animal can claim, no matter how cute they are, no matter how glorious they are. And so we are to act as those who bear the image of God, and we're to treat others as those who bear the image of God. I love how my colleague, Pastor Kim Barger puts it. He says, it is, a, it is a divine image bearer who is forced to dumpster dive and who sleeps on the street intoxicated or in a chemical fog. It is a divine image bearer who is aborted from their mother's womb or whose life is taken in an inner city drive-by. It is a divine image bearer who slanders another divine image bearer with their speech or harms them with acts of violence. The Christian view of humanity teaches us that men and women are not mere animals at the top of the food chain, but that we are all divine image bearers. Human life, even after the fall, is precious and is so much more than mere electrical impulse surging through nerves and muscles. If we are divine image bearers, then even one single life going to waste is a tragedy. Every single human being possesses in some measure the good gifts given Adam by his Creator. Only Christianity gives humanity such worth and dignity. And so remember that as you interact with your family members this week in the home, or your coworkers, or your students, or your teachers, or your classmates, or your fellow church members, or your neighbors, or the people driving slow in front of you in traffic and kind of annoying you, or the grocery store clerk, or the person begging for money outside the grocery store, or the Starbucks employee, or the restaurant server, or the elderly person you interact with, or the infant, or the child that you interact with. And even, remember this when you interact with your enemies. Remember that they are all created in the image of God and have worth and dignity as image bearers. Love your neighbor as yourself because they are created in the image of God. And because God has redeemed you and freed you to love your neighbor. But secondly, it's good to point out here that death is not natural. Death is not natural. Some people view it as just a natural part of life. But nothing could be further from the truth. We were created for life. Death is a consequence of sin. And this is why we grieve the loss of loved ones. Death is our enemy. But even death has been conquered for us in Christ. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And so we rejoice in that. Even as we mourn death. And not only will we be made alive in Christ when He returns by being raised from the dead bodily, we already are alive in Him as those who are forgiven of all our sins and are being renewed in His image. You see, in our sanctification... We're no longer the same as we were before we were born again. We now have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is renewing us in the image of God, in the image of Christ, in true righteousness and holiness and the knowledge of God. And so everything that was lost in Adam is being restored for us in Christ, our second Adam. And third, when we truly understand that we are radically corrupt by nature outside of Christ, and that there's nothing in us that had anything to do with our salvation. We should be humble before God and each other, for we owe Him all the glory for our salvation. We can truly sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And so let us walk in humility towards God and others 
and thank Him and give Him all the glory in our salvation. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word and we do confess that apart from Christ, we would have forever been lost and without hope in this world of salvation. But we praise You that You have saved us from our sins and misery. You've opened our hearts to believe and trust in Christ. Help us to never take that for granted and for, to always praise Your name. And Father, help us to share the Gospel with others and open the hearts of our lost loved ones and family members and friends for only You can open their hearts. And so do that. Glorify Your name and bring in all Your elect people that Your name might be praised. That we might praise You for Your glorious grace. Father, help us to live lives of gratitude and help us to love our neighbor who is created in the image of God this week. And Father, help us to look forward to the day when we will be perfectly like Christ. We'll see Him as He is and be radically transformed once and for all perfectly into the image of Christ and never again sin and never again suffer any of the consequences of sin but forever be confirmed in that glorious state of righteousness and blessedness forever to praise You, our triune God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.